Yeah, it's great to be back. Um, we have two events that we are hosting this this week um, that have to do with the end of the Civil War. Of course, 150 years ago this month was a very momentous time in American history. We were celebrating the end of the Civil War, the surrender at Appomattox, and the cessation of hostilities, if you will, between the North and the South, if they have ever truly ceased. <laughs> and then, of You course, mean the War of Northern Aggression? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you need to say that with a bit more of a Southern drawl, though, to make it effective. Yes, yes. <laughs> And then going from rapture in the north and excitement and relief that the war was over, of course the, plunge, the country was plunged into grief a few days later when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. And this is an anniversary that is being marked across the country by different historical organizations. The Henry Ford Museum is doing a whole series of events based around the chair that they have in their collection, which is the actual chair Lincoln was sitting in when he was assassinated. At Ford Theater? At Ford's Theater, yes. And we are going to be hosting several events here in Lansing. Um, this is partially timed with our Lansing Goes to War exhibit that is in Lansing City Hall. And that does include some artifacts from the Civil War, including a copy of a speech given by Lansing's Luther Baker, who actually led the sort of hunting party, if you will, that actually captured John Wilkes Booth. Mm. And on Thursday, we are going to be hearing from a descendant of Dr. Samuel Mudd. Um, after Booth shot President Lincoln and sort of jumped half fell from the balcony down onto the stage, um, he injured himself. He actually broke a bone in his leg just above his ankle. And as he was fleeing into the South, uh, hopefully hoping to end up in the Confederate heartland where no one would ever think of, of turning him over to the authorities, um, he actually stopped for medical treatment at the home of Dr. Samuel Mudd, who was a practicing physician who lived uh, not too far outside of DC. And the debate has waged for 150 years as to did Mudd know who this was? Right. Is he a co-conspirator yeah. in the entire effort? Um, some feel that he was. Uh, the book Manhunt makes a case that Mudd knew John Wilkes Booth, that he was actually part of an earlier conspiracy attempt to kidnap the president, although Mudd claimed that he had no idea that the kidnapping had turned into an assassination. And it's um, thought that Mudd may have treated him before he actually realized what had happened. And we have to remember, this is in an age when news does not travel as fast as it does today. No tweets. You have no tweets, you have no cell phone chirping in your pocket with every last event that happens. And there's some thought that when John Wilkes Booth arrived at his house, he may not have realized that he had just indeed killed the president. Now when I uh, teach, by the way, uh, I talk about the fact that when Lincoln was elected, that the Pony Express meant you might not get your newspaper out west for two months. So yes. you wouldn't know two months after the election who the president was, literally. Right. So, I mean, it was that kind of era. Mm -hmm. It was. And there's also the physician's code of ethics in this, oh. where we are to treat anyone under any circumstances who is in need. Now. Was he obligated to treat him and then turn him into authorities? Was and what had happened? It's a touchy question, and it's a question that continues to be debated by historians and scholars today. And we are going to be joined on Thursday evening by a descendant of Dr. Mudd. Uh, the family has a branch that lives here in Michigan, up in the Bay City area. And he is going to be coming and he is going to present his case for why his ancestor was not part of the conspiracy and was not an accomplice of Booth, if you will. The family has a vested interest in that version, I suspect. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> they do. And they have, uh, over the last couple generations, they have attempted to get uh, pardons from everyone, including the president, actually. They were issued a presidential pardon, I believe, back in the 1970s. They have worked very, very hard to clear their ancestor's name. And they will be, um, Mr. Mudd will be speaking at the East Lansing Public Library. Uh, the event is co-sponsored by the Friends of the East Lansing Library. And it will be, I've never heard this gentleman speak before. I have heard of him many times mm. and have heard uh, many people talk about his lecture. But I'm very curious to see how he presents his case and what evidence he uses. 
Well, I had a friend in high school whose name was Linda Sapp, S-A-P-P, -P, right? And all she kept talking about was, I can't wait to get married and get rid of this name. She married into the Mud Clan, so she oh. went from Sapp to Mud, <laughs> which she didn't figure, not only was it not much of an improvement, right, in terms of the last name, but there was that sort of stigma still about the Mud name. No, and that's why they talk about dragging your name through the mud, well, right? Now, this is a spoiler alert, but the phrase, your name is Mud, was not did not pertain. It did not. You know, it goes back to the 1700s. What is the? What was, the was the incident? In a play. Oh, it was it in was a play. play. Was it about the Mud family? Or no, anything? not at all. Nothing to do with them. Huh. Just dragging person literally through the mud. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, well, that'll do it. But uh, I think during the Mud Sand Mud era, it became very popular again. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, I would imagine so. Yeah, there was an additional reason to use that phrase. There's been a couple movies made about Dr. Samuel mm -hmm. Mudd. Because huh. he tr treated, I think, cholera, was it? Yes. In, in the prison he was at. He got a, he got a pardon. Mm -hmm. He got a presidential pardon from the prison. Who in that conspiracy, ultimately, how many were convicted and what happened to them? Do you know? Uh, there was the woman, what was her There name? was Mary Surratt. Mary Surratt. Who owned uh, a boarding house in the yeah, area. She was probably was the implicated. least guilty. Probably, but that was big news when she was convicted because they put her to death. Yeah. And they one did not they? put women to death in the 19th century very often. They were the fairer sex who didn't deserve such things. They lynched them a lot. From they did. Yeah. They did. Well, and there was a big question as to what to do with Booth's body also. Um, because they didn't want it to become a place oh. of public mourning for Confederate sympathizers. Oh. So not only do you have to figure out who you're going to convict and what you're going to convict them of, but for those who are killed in the process, those who were lynched or even Booth himself who was shot, um, there's a question of what to do with their remains. It's, oh, it's wow. very, very sticky because we had just literally finished war. No one we thought the war was over, but of course there's always the potential to see things flaring back up again. And the last thing they wanted was to give Southerners a rallying point around mm -hmm. this. So the trial happened pretty quickly. Six weeks, maybe? Fast. They were hung um, in July. Wow. And when did he... Military he, tribunal. He lingered for quite a while. Who? Lincoln. No, overnight. Overnight. Overnight, that's, that's all? all? Yes. Mm -hmm. I thought overnight. it was longer than that, actually. No. Okay. Oh, okay. So it I wasn't... Well, and of course, we have to remember, too, that he was not the only one that was the target of the plot. Oh. Um, for example, Seward. Seward was, was stabbed was also, repeatedly. And, was, and there was a terrible scene with his daughter, who was actually at the home watching over him. And it was supposed to be a much larger conspiracy. They were supposed to um, assassinate the vice president as well, Andrew Johnson. The idea was to take out the main leaders in Washington and throw the entire government into disarray. Yeah, yeah. it was a large plot. I it mean, was. It was very and then, of course, Grant was mysteriously out of town. Yeah. So that's where all the conspiracy things come in. It was mm. there's a lot of very odd things that happen around that. There was that famous list that you must remember, Bill, when um, President Kennedy was assassinated about how Vice President Johnson takes over, and there were all the similarities between the Lincoln assassination and the Kennedy assassination. And we see that the it's interesting that there there are all these questions that still linger, not only about Kennedy but all the way back to. The, you know, Lincoln's assassination. There's still people that are fighting that one out, as this family always does. Oh, says. absolutely, you know? absolutely. You know, because there was some thought that the this plot emanated from the South. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. You know, from the leadership of the South. Yeah, right. It wasn't. Yeah, not just Southern sympathizers, but no. that they were connected. And then, you know, in a world where there's only six degrees of separation, and in a smaller world, when that probably made it three. Um, it wouldn't be too hard to build that kind of case, I wouldn't think. You know, you're talking about the similarities. What I just learned on Friday at an event was John Wilkes Booth slept, I think it was six weeks prior, in the same bed that Lincoln died in. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. I mean, <laughs> stop that. Creepy stop. stuff. Yeah, stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> yeah. It was like, okay. Hmm. We still haven't resolved some of these issues. I mean, they're really still, I mean, the people involved have all passed away, but there's still family history here, too. Well, you know, and relatively recently, maybe 20 years ago or maybe even less, uh, there was talk about exhuming the body of John Wilkes Booth yes. to prove that it was mm -hmm. him. And I can't remember if they I actually if they did, did do that. Because yeah. his body was hidden for a while. It was mm -hmm. in a hidden grave. Yeah. And they, then they finally did bury him in the family grave. Yeah, they released it. Hmm. Quite the era. 
It sure was. You think about it, that was the first assassination of a president. Well, and the timing of it, too, you have the end of the war, and Lincoln was actually shot on Good Friday. So mm -hmm. you have the whole religious association, and here you have the savior of the country who has brought us forward, and now he has been struck down. And for many people who spoke in the language of George Washington being the father of our country, became the son who came to offer salvation in the time of need. And it takes on deeply religious overtones. I see. And of course, while all of this is playing out with Booth, the country is draping things in black crepe and going into deep mourning. But there was a lot of anxiety as to who this assassin was, what he was doing out there. And it's almost kind of comical how ill-planned Booth's escape was. Right, right. It was get Not down into plan. the South, and that was about it. And he didn't have contacts along the way. He did not have particular places he was trying to stop. Um, it's actually amazing to me that he lasted the 12 days he did. Or even got out of Washington, <laughs> D.C. Yeah. Because there was only one bridge to cross. Did Bill O'Reilly wave at him as he went? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm he sure he was there. He him? must have, because he's written a book he's about He's written it. a book on him, and I'm sure he wrote himself in. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. Well, and then it became, as you're saying, it was the, the question of who could take credit for capturing Booth. Right. Because there was this party that went after him, which we're interested, of course, because it was led by Luther Baker, who would come back to Lansing afterwards. And the party was put together by Lafayette Baker of Lansing, who was Luther's cousin. Wow. But afterwards, of course, everyone wants to be the hero. And what about Boston Corbett? Was, did he do the right thing when he shot Booth? Did he do the wrong thing? Should Booth have been brought to trial? And suddenly you he have played the all, Jack Ruby role. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And suddenly you have all of these people who are wanting to cash in on the money. It's said that Luther Baker made some serious real estate investments in Lansing based on the thought he was going to get the money and then he didn't get as much as he wanted to. So it, it was quite a circus. It really was. It's strange, isn't it? I mean, that's part of real, real American history is that we've never been able to resolve these things. We have a leader struck down and we still have questions, you know, literally hundreds of years later. And they'll never be solved unless they find something in somebody's attic, which they're often doing. But. Well, they are. It's really a surprise how much turns up. Yeah, that's At least in that way. era, it would likely be uh, written down someplace, I think, in the if it happens in this era, the pixels well, are going to Booth's disappear. Booth's diary disappeared. Oh. Our pages were cut out of it, about 15 pages. Hmm. A critical 15? Mm, maybe. Sort of <laughs> an 18 minute gap, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. The tape was sliced. It was pretty, yeah, there was, and it went to Washington and it, pages were cut out of it. Wow. So, it is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7, here in Lansing, Michigan. We're talking with Valerie Marvin of the Historical Society of Greater Lansing about the upcoming events. Did we also want to talk about what you've been working on with your project with uh, some other memorabilia from that? Oh, sure. Um, I've been, for the last, it seems like, decade, <laughs> we discovered a while back a series of 50, 60 letters from a Civil War soldier to uh, his girl back home. And those letters um, are very telling about the time he spent in the war. He enlisted in 1861 and he served through 1865. So he was in the war four years and never had a furlough which was pretty unusual. Um, he sent letter, he sent 63 letters survive. Uh, she, her letters do not survive. And when you read his letters, you can understand why, because he was constantly losing them on the battlefield. Um, and he, like I said, he never got home. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I found interesting in the letters is um, as, they, as he wrote them to her, he got closer to her, her emotionally. He, be, he began, at he, one point he became critical of her attending dances back home. Because I think when he went off to war, she was only in high school. Because he said, be good to your teachers. Um, so it's a, it's Words a, to live by from my perspective as we're running. <laughs> yeah. uh, this, this gentleman too, uh, Nathan Adams, was also hospitalized quite a bit during the war. Now hospitalized means he was in a field hospital. Uh, and he's, he's assigned to a field hospital to work quite a few times. Well, at the end of the war, they do the tally. Uh, out, of, out of 950 men in the battalion, there, 190 died from disease. Wow. Yeah, 130 died from 
battlefield injuries. And In, infection killed more than the yes, bullets. Yes, absolutely. They shot, were yeah. constantly sick. Yeah. They, they had a terrible life in the field. And it, the letters also talk about the drudgery of mm -hmm. just waiting to march, Ugh. waiting to do this. Waiting yeah. to die in some And, they, and they, they talk about that. He's pretty blunt about that, whether he's going to die now or later or when. And um, But he was a very prolific writer. His spelling was very bad. <laughs> but he used some very, he used the word like parse. He called it parse, but I think it was parse. <laughs> um, they're fascinating look at a period in time um, that no longer takes place when people go off to war, they Skype now. Right, right. Or text. Right. None of that will be saved. Uh, it's really unfortunate that the woman's letters back to him were. The NSA happened. will have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's saved. It's just a question of whether we can see it's it. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a very good point. But I, I think um, people will enjoy it. There's going to be two um, people portraying uh, the man and the woman, and they'll read parts of each letter. Like she receives them from him, uh, and I, I think people will get an idea how close these two became. Um, it's well known they got married after the war. I see. And they had five children. But I did not know at the end of the war, he comes home to Michigan, and it takes them two months to meet her. Really? It's the strangest story, and you can't really piece it all quite together. He goes to his, like, a brother's house. 100 miles away, but 100 miles away was like a long way. Long way, so he didn't drop in for the weekend. And then things get in the way, and it took him about two months to get to her place. Wow. And that would be my first place to, I think. One would think. Yeah. Hmm. But I, I think people will get a good feel for how bad the food was, <laughs> how, how, how the war was fought. It wasn't the best organized war all the time. There is a chef, isn't there, who's trying to recreate some of the southern meals of that era that I think is quite interesting. Yeah. We're actually going to be hosting a professor from Michigan State later on in the month who has done a couple cookbooks based on food in the North and the South during the Civil War. Really? Yes. Um, her name is Helen Veet. You know Helen. Oh, Helen, yeah. yeah. Helen, she'll be joining us the last weekend of the commemoration, which will be uh, Sunday, April 26th, back at the State Historical Center again. So Helen and I tried a lot to make a project fly where we would have revived the old America Eats program from the oh, World really? WPA in the 1930s. In order to keep artists and writers alive, they commissioned people to go out and write about stories of people and food in groups. And they, um, uh, Nelson Algren and a lot of famous radio, Dora Welty, were out there doing these kinds of pieces. And we think it would be time to do that again. But It's a fantastic resource, I can tell you as a historian. <laughs> yeah, and you know, um, Helen had the opportunity. She's gone down to D.C. and digitized the two boxes of materials that were down there that had never really been brought out and wow. published anywhere. So she was able to get at least a small grant to go down and do that. She's a brilliant woman, really fascinating. And she has frequently guest lectured in some of my classes. And she's one of those creative professors that does things, you know, she she brings them challenges that they have to work out and uh, makes games out of things. She's very, very good. So that'll be fun. You'll have a good time with her. That'll be great. So what are the dates we need to keep in mind? Thursday evening, so this is April 9th at 7 p.m., is when we will be learning about the mystery of Dr. Mudd and, Dr. Mudd and John Wilkes Booth. That's at the East Lansing Public Library. And the, the event is free and open to the public. And then on Saturday, April 11th, we will be at the State of Michigan Library. That's 702 West Kalamazoo Street, downtown here. That's in the building of the Michigan Historical Center, which is where the library, the archives, and the State Historical Museum are all located. Um, that will be at 2 p.m. With the big tree in the middle. With the big tree in the middle. Dying. Yes. Yeah, he's dying, isn't he? <laughs> it looks really bad. Mm -hmm. They hadn't planned that or something wrong? Or? Well, it's been 30 years. Oh, trees weren't meant to live like that. I don't think that's a good habitat for it, no. Yeah, I don't think so. I interrupted no. you, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. And so those are the two events that we need to know about. Yes. There's one other thing that's happening in conjunction with the East Lansing Library yes. uh, visit is a local collector, his name is Rick Brown, he's been collecting um, assassination ephemera since he was 16, which is 50 years ago. So he started collecting the original newspapers the day of or the mm. week after the day Lincoln was buried, things like that, and other ephemera. And he's going to put on an exhibit for three days, 11 to 7 p.m. at East Lansing Public Library, where you'll be able to see 30 to 50 rare, very rare items 
hmm? from the Civil War era. And then the week after, that will be going to the downtown Lansing Library, where it will be on display the 14th, 15th, and 16th. Mm -hmm. And on Thursday, the 16th, he will be giving a talk about Michigan's connections to the assassination and will be showing several objects from his collection as a part of that talk. Hmm. Well, very, we're at Civil War era right now. We've moved heavily into the Civil War. You went from Lansing goes to war with maybe later wars, even the French and Indian War earlier, and now we're heavily into the Civil War. So it's a lot of good activities coming up in the community. Thank you so much for joining us. Always Hope a pleasure. Keep us apprised of what's going on.